what i was discussing earlier that uh, there is a critical angle and nickel is one of the good element best possibly the best element which gives you a critical angle this critical angle is dependent on lambda linearly so this gives a critical angle of 6 arc minutes per angstrom that means for a 1 angstrom neutron neutron it will be 6 arc minutes for a 4 angstrom neutron 1 angstrom neutron for a 4 angstrom neutron for a 4 angstrom neutron it is 6 into 4 24 arc minutes this critical angle this value theta it will be 24 arc minutes for a 4 angstrom neutron then it will fall also as i told you that if i magnetize a nickel medium usually it is in form of thin films then for magnetization direction with respect to neutron spin we will have two different critical angles i stopped at this point now i'll come to neutron supermeters <coughs> a neutron supermeter as the name suggests that it is over a, much more than a mirror thing is that we need to reflect neutrons up to a large angle it can be theta or q whichever unit we use how to do that in general we know that if i have a periodic medium now i'll straight away go into thin film suppose i have a thin film which has got a coating of a layer and the coating of b layer so is bilayer i keep coating which has got some d spacing of d <coughs> which is equal to da plus db now we know that for a given d spacing in crystallography 2d sin theta equal to lambda and you have got a bragg peak same thing can be said for this uh, you can say artificial crystal that you have created with a and b artificial crystal but this is exactly same using the same logic we can say that if this d spacing is fixed that means what i need to do actually i need to take a substrate on which i keep on piling up this media a and b typically thickness about 50 to 100 angstrom of each layer if i do that then apart from the reflectivity curve i should also get a bragg peak at some point which is twice pi so twice pi by d dictates at which q i will have a bragg peak <coughs> now this is the story for a single periodicity that means i make stacks with 1d now the next step is that i keep making stacks but i keep changing the thickness continuously that means d keeps varying d is varying now so <clears throat> so i continuously keep changing this d value if i do that i can define this thin film stack as consisting of several d spacings and then it will have broad peaks at all these d values so now now the critical angle 
Now the critical angle, I had a critical angle up to which it was 1 and then it was falling. But now the way I plan these D spacings that it is taken over by the Bragg peaks for various D spacings. So by this technique, I can extend this critical angle if it was a theta c to a large value. And this is how theta c for super mirrors are much higher than the theta c for a single element. That means best example is nickel titanium mirrors. Reason being, we know that the reflection takes place whenever there is a refractive index contrast. Uh, titanium has got a negative scattering length. Scattering length. This is a question mark. I leave it with a question mark now. Just accept the fact that few elements have got negative scattering length and then n is greater than 1. Nickel has got a positive scattering length, so n is less than 1. So a layer of nickel and another layer of titanium, they have excellent contrast because excellent difference in refractive index are between the two media and there will be strong reflection. And then the next step is to design a super mirror with a variable D spacing and I can get a super mirror which can reflect up to a very large angle and that means I can reflect neutrons up to a critical angle which is large compared to a single element. For a single element as I showed you earlier that it is uh, around 6 angstrom, 6 arc minutes per angstrom for nickel. In this case this goes much larger and usual comparison is with respect to nickel always. So if I say I have got a super mirror which has got uh, which is m equal to 2 which has got m equal to 2 m equal to 2 then an m equal to 2 super mirror will have critical angle which is 12 arc minutes per angstrom for neutrons. Similarly m equal to 4 will have 24 arc minutes arc minutes per angstrom for neutrons and this is not an indefinite game because you also have to think that neutrons are penetrating in a medium and getting reflected from each and every interface and how thick you can make the medium till the absorption starts taking over. But this is possible and that is how neutron super mirrors are made. So we have been talking about neutron super mirrors. And super mirrors are actually bilayer stacks. If I have a bilayer stack with a single periodicity, then it is like a one dimensional crystal which has, whose periodicity dictates where will be the Bragg peak. Similarly, for the mirror, if I have a single periodicity, then I will have a Bragg peak at some Q value. Q value or at some theta value, I will have a Bragg peak. Now this Bragg peak is not an atomic Bragg peak, but by the same principle, it's, a, it's like a virtual one dimensional crystal, which gives a Bragg peak depending on its D spacing, which I just told you, in case of nickel titanium, it will be D nickel plus D titanium. titanium. And this is, this Bragg peak position is dictated by twice pi by D for this particular single periodic step. But now the clever manipulation is that in case of neutron super mirror, we vary the D value in our thin film mirror. So this is truly like a mirror and actually you look, look at it, it will look like a daily use mirror which is we are familiar but this is of course at a much lower angle and with a much higher precision this needs to be made. Now D is a variable now. D is a variable 
for a super mirror. When d is a variable, in that case, the as I told you, that I can have the black peaks overlapping with each other because d is varying continuously, and this can push the critical angle to an outer outer means to a higher angles theta and then it will fall so this critical angle is a critical angle for the super mirror for the super mirror so this can be compared with the critical angle of a single film and usually in case of in the field of neutron super mirror it is compared with nickel i am repeating again nickel has got 6 arc minutes per angstrom of neutron wavelength. That means a 4 angstrom neutron will have a critical angle of 24 arc minutes. And when I talk about super mirrors, an m equal to 2 super mirror will have twice this value. So it will have 12 arc minutes per angstrom uh, at the critical angle. And for 6 angstrom, it will be uh, 36 arc minutes, more than half a degree. And the trick is that you have a plane substrate, usually this is called float glass, float glass, on which you keep depositing thin films. It, using thin film deposition technique, you have a specific bilayer and you know how you can calculate out how to change the thickness of the layers and you keep growing this step with variable thickness and ultimately you get, I will show the photos later, that reflectivity as a function of theta, it goes out to a much larger angle compared to what you can find for a single element. So this, that's why it's called super mirror because the critical angle is large and you can reflect neutrons, reflection means here this sort of Bragg law, I would say Snell's law, which follows Snell's law. The neutron reflection follows Snell's law, and that so far as the total scattering is concerned, and it can the critical angle is much higher compared to any elements in case of neutron super mirrors. So I just uh, show you the so I showed you the critical angle for a silicon wafer and I discussed the super mirror. Now I can show you, this is the source, Swiss Neutronics, it is available uh, from them. It has got a critical angle which is uh, almost uh, 8 times, you can see some super mirrors have a critical angle up to 8 times of nickel. That means 8 into 6, 48 arc minutes per angstrom for this super mirror. So these are the various super mirrors available from them. It is written as m equal to 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, up to 8 you can go. Of course the slope, rather the reflectivity is not exactly 1. Actually you can see that by the time we have gone m equal to 8, the reflectivity has come down to almost 50 percent. But if you talk about m equal to 3, or four super mirrors, you have got a very good reflectivity of 80 percent and these are actually mirrors for neutrons and that's why I call that the neutron super mirrors. But so far I have not talked about, I have I started talking about polarizers and I introduced you to neutron super mirrors. Now let me get, get back to super mirror polarizers. So in case of super mirrors also, I have got two different critical angles. One is for B coherent plus B magnetic and the other is B coherent minus B magnetic. So I can design now super mirrors in which a magnetic, usually a magnetic like nickel and a non-magnetic material are coated in alternate layers with a variable periodicity and this super mirrors needs to be magnetized. Once I do that, what? Like here is a nickel, I show you the actual design data 
nickel manganese super mirror and you can see that the critical angles are so different. Now how does it help in polarizing? So now I get back to the story of polarization. So now I have got this reflectivity versus theta. Let me just simplify it. So I have got a critical angle and then the fall for positive one and I have got the reflectivity plot for the negative polarization. Now you can see that if I reflect a neutron at angles beyond the critical for the negative polarization, so now for reflection at angles between beyond this and less than this, between these two, for an unpolarized beam, the one polarization is reflected and the other polarization is not reflected, they are not lost, they get transmitted. So I have got a transmitted beam which is positively polarized and uh, I mean sorry, a reflected beam which is positively polarized and a transmitted beam which is negatively polarized. So this is a positively polarized beam but this whole exercise is done mostly for cold neutrons because for thermal neutrons reason being as I said that the critical angle is dependent on lambda. So for thermal neutron this lambda is of the order of one angstrom the critical angles are too small and difficult to control. We talk about cold neutrons when the wavelength is 4 angstrom or higher or higher longer or longer. When the wavelength is 4 angstrom or longer typically they are known as cold neutrons and for cold neutron polarization polarizing super mirrors super mirrors are used routinely nowadays they are commercially available and experiments with neutron reflectometry or small angle neutron scattering if we have to do with polarized beam, it makes sense to using polarizing super mirror. So I have talked to you about single crystal Bragg diffraction from magnetic sample for polarization of thermal neutron beams. Now I have explained to you how neutron polarizing super mirrors are used to polarize cold neutrons in general. Another class of upcoming polarizer is a helium 3 polarizer. This is in principle it is simple in practice it is it needs very high technology. So this is a iron silicon polarizing super mirror where as I told you that you can see that the up neutron reflectivity is very high up to a very large uh, Q value. This Q value will dictate what is the lambda or what is the theta because Q is equal to 4 pi by lambda sin theta and for the down neutron it goes down to 0 very often. So if I consider 0.33 already the reflectivity of the down neutrons is 0. So any angle beyond this will give me a polarized reflected beam and also polarized transmitted beam because the neutron which is not reflected are transmitted through the polarizer. So this is a iron silicon super mirror polarizer available from uh, as I the source is I have taken the data from Swiss Neutronics site. Now coming back to helium 3 polarizing super mirrors. This is a transmission polarizer. There has been long attempt to use helium 3 gases spin dependent when I say spin dependent it is nuclear spin dependent absorption for polarizing transmitted beams large area transmitted beams 
So this is spin dependent neutron capture in an intermediate state where the helium 3 absorbs a neutron and then decays to a triton and a proton. But interestingly, neutrons with spin component anti parallel to the helium 3 nuclear spin. When you talk about helium 3 polarizers, it is a nuclear spin which absorbs. So that means this has a very tall order of polarizing helium 3 gas by using some techniques. Now, helium 3 gas polarization is done by interaction of this helium 3 in a cell with a laser beam and after that we get polarization of helium 3. So the transmission for two spins that means we have the helium 3 gas the nuclear polarization which has taken place and now we can write down the transmission as an exponential term. Sigma 0 is the absorption cross section for the unpolarized neutrons but it get boosted by 1 minus or 1 plus polarization of the helium nuclear the nuclear absorption uh, nuclear polarization so it can be as high as 6000 burn for the anti parallel neutron so that's why one spin component goes out and since it's a transmission polarizer since it's a transmission polarizer It's a transmission polarizer. <clears throat> this is a transmission polarizer. In a simplistic terms, you can have very large beam cross sections for some experiments, which can be polarized in the transmission mode. So you have you have got plus beam, minus beam, minus gets absorbed very strongly if the helium 3 nuclei helium 3 nuclei are polarized and this polarization is done by its interaction with a laser so I am just quoting it this is an old paper so it was the status at a, in 2005 at NIST and this tells that a it uh, is done through polar interaction with two laser beams and uh, how the gas is stored in a buffer cell. I myself, I don't want to get into the details of this, the details of the theory of this uh, polarization, but the basic fact is that helium-3 gas with nuclear polarization can be used for transmission of one component of neutron spin that is the basics of it but now it has advanced much more and today at ILL Grenoble and NIST uh, there are helium cells which are put in line with the neutron beams and polarized beams are used so this completes my target of telling you how neutron is polarized for application next part is a brief part is flipper so here it is the data from the same paper and uh, it shows the polarization efficiency of 91.2 percent but even at that time the time the polarization could be held uh, let us at 80 percent was 250 to 300 seconds it has increased a lot at the moment and that's why because the, if the polarization is lost quickly then the transmission polarizer also loses its efficiency so not only we need to polarize helium 3 but you also need to maintain the polarization for sufficiently long time for which the polarizer can be used in the neutron beam so in this paper the time was around 250 250 seconds i should say 250 seconds is around 4 minutes for which uh, one can have a good polarized neutron beam. 
I uh, understand that this has gone much higher today. But this is not an often used technique. The often used techniques are what I discussed earlier, the crystal polarizer, bracket scattering, and the multilayer based super mirror polarizers. Now, the last part of this talk is about flippers. So, we not only need to polarize the neutron beam, but we also need to, because there is a sample which is possibly magnetized in some direction, and we need to have polarization along and sometimes polarization opposite to get the two different intensities of scattered, Bragg scattered or mirror scattered beams. And many times we also need to do a polarization analysis of the reflected beam. So we need to flip the neutron spin after polarization depending on the experimental requirements. So the flipping is as simple as say that uh, up spin by flipping I should take it to down spin. So there are several types of flippers I will just briefly tell you about RF spin flipper. Here actually the neutron is polarized in the z direction in a guide field let us call it B. So if z is the direction then I call it BZ that is the B0Z and then in radio frequency flipper if this is the if the particle is moving in y direction and x direction is normal to it then we can apply a radio frequency field and RF field which is rotating in this plane. When it is rotating in this plane then you can see that this neutron sees a field which is a cone and which sees a static field of B component, Y component of the B of this rotating RF frequency. And then in this field, the neutron will undergo precision, undergo precision. And if the Larmor precision frequency of this neutron, I can match with the, there is a Larmor precision frequency depending on the guide field B0. And if I can match the Larmor precision frequency with the field in the y direction, then the depending on the length of the RF cavity, the neutron will go out with a flip spin. So this is called RF spin flipper being used right from the beginning of neutron scattering. And later, one more kind of spin flippers are introduced by Mezei, known as DC flipper. This is much easier to understand. Here actually the BG is the direction of the field, guide field and neutron spins as you can see they are up over here. You just take it through a guide, uh, through a field which actually there are three components of the field. One is that minus BG to cancel the effect of this BG and the field as you can see it is a solenoid. So it is a normal to the spin of the neutron and in this field depending on the velocity of the neutron and the field value the neutron undergoes the precision. So if we can choose a certain wavelength and accordingly the length of the DC flipper which the neutron has to traverse then we get flipped neutron spin coming out from the other side of the flipper and the guide field you can see the field written as a guide field plus compensating fields and the field in which the neutron is undergoing uh, precision and flipping. So I have discussed with you two types of flipper. One is a neutron spin flipper, one is a DC flipper or a Meze flippers. Most of the laboratories use these two kinds of flippers for neutron spin flipping for use in magnetic neutron diffraction or reflection or even analysis of the scattered beam. So with this 
I come to an end for uh, in the discussion regarding neutron polarizers and neutron flippers.